Welcome to Harvest Valley Worship Center's Sermon of the Week. You can discover more about our church, pastors, and special guests at hvwc.com. We hope that you are blessed by today's message. What has that got to do with God? Well, the first thing that I got from it is, I do some California dreaming because I've got three sons that live in L.A., and I haven't been, down, been able to go see them since they've lived there. So I'd love to go to California, to L.A., and see them. So I'm thinking, so what, what else do you want to say about this guy? What are you doing? And he, one of the things in there, it says, uh, the, original, the song was wrote in 1963 by Michelle and John Phillips, who were part of that group right there, the Mamas and the Papas. And the reason that that verse, there's a verse in there that says, which I didn't, I didn't hear it right for lots of years. It says, I stopped by a church. I passed along the way. Well, I got down on my knees and pretended to pray. I thought it said I began to pray. It says, I pretended to pray. Well, as it turns out, Michelle had actually, he wrote this in 63 on a cold winter night um, and woke up and didn't have it all and he needed another verse. So she came up with that verse because she'd actually visited the um, St. Patrick's Cathedral earlier that week. And, and they don't profess to be Christians, but they like to visit churches. Not quite sure how that works, but... But when I read that, and, and, I, and after I figured out what it actually said, God said, it's time to stop pretending. It's time for my body to stop pretending. It's time to do what you're supposed to do. I'm like, wow. And then he said, it says in there about the, the next line is, you know, the, the preacher didn't mind him being in there. The reason he went in there was because he was cold. It was a cold winter's day in New York and he didn't want to be outside. So he went into the church to get warm, pretended to pray so that he could stay there longer. And, and it says that, the, you know, the preacher didn't mind that he stayed there even though he knew that he was just there because it was cold. Because if you can get around the presence, you're going to soak it up. You're going to catch something. And it's not going to be a cold. <laughs> the other one that he just... And, and it's amazing when he gives me these songs, they just, he just keeps putting things in there. The other one that he just gave me, you saw me grab a pen and write while he was doing this, is it's all about perspective too. They're talking about how gray it is, how cold it is, how terrible it is. Why do you want to look at that side? Look at the good side. Look at the bright side of what's going on. And the other thing is, don't be dreaming about somewhere else when God's put you in a place. Do what He wants you to do where He's put you now. I'm not saying you won't get to that place, but He's got you in the place you are for a reason. And that reason is to do His work. So in this, although they didn't profess to be Christians, I don't know if you know who uh, have ever heard of the, the group Wilson Phillips, the two ladies. China Phillips is their daughter, who is about the most outspoken Christian out there, as far as singers go. So whether they meant to or not, they planted that seed in her somehow, because they didn't go to church she was actually saved in a youth group, but for some reason, she caught that seed and went in and gave her life to God and now professes it all the time. And they say that outspoken Christian. You know what that means? <laughs> it means she tells everybody she's Christian. Same thing we should all be doing. Tell people about God. So that's how we start. And it's amazing when things start coming together. We were praying this morning. We were praying over the weekend. A few of these guys saying things is that we need to shine our light. That's the name of this, is it's time to be the light. 
It's time for us to be the light. Now, Chris has just gone through a series on being holy. And he uh, did an amazing job. I just, he has grown, you know, I've been here for six years and he's grown so much in the, just the last couple of years when he came back and really trying to focus more on the Bible, explaining what's happening, telling people what it is instead of just up here preaching. And I think it's amazing. Now I can honestly tell you that when he told me to do that, he asked me to do this because he knew they were going to be gone. I'm like, yeah, great. And I've struggled with what I was going to say and what I was going to do. And Mike has been struggling too. And it's like, God, is this really what you want me to do? Am I supposed to, am I an imposter up there just doing this? What am I, what am I doing? And he's saying, no, you're right where you're supposed to be. I'm giving you this because I know that you can touch hearts different than Chris can touch hearts. Micah was talking about the, the group that she does with the ladies and she just said they, they did an exercise where they put a, a, wrote something down on a paper and just put it in. I don't know anything about the group, but I know what Micah did because Micah doesn't share with what because that's confidential, but she told me what she wrote down. She wrote down that she's a failure and put it in there. And she said all the ladies looked at her and went, What? Because they can come and attack us, but we have to be ready to fight what he's saying and believing what the Lord is saying about us, not what the enemy is saying about us. Because I look at her and I think, how could you ever think you're a failure with all the things that you do and all the ladies and men that you touch with what you do? How could you possibly think you're a failure? Now, as you know, being a husband or a wife, you can say that to your husband and wife. And they'll believe it and they'll take it. But when they hear it from somebody else, it's even stronger. So I just say, if you know somebody that's down, build them up. That's what synergy is. Chris keeps talking about synergy. It's being able to do more than what you can by yourself, but it's also being able to raise everybody up as you go to keep things moving. So anyway, Chris had done those. There's just a couple things, verses that he'd had in there that I kind of wanted to bring up. One was 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, But you are, cho- you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the, the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, who once who once were not a people who are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It's like when Chris was going through that and saying that, we have to do our part, but God's the one that makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy. It's up to God to do that. And the other verse was was Hebrews 9 and 10, which says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus, Christ once and for all. Christ's death made us holy. That sanctified us. I know Chris had said this, but I I think you really need to understand that that sanctified us, that made us holy. We still have to walk in what we're supposed to do, but that made us holy by what he sanctified us and made us that way. We need to accept that and live like that. Now, I can be totally honest. There's the struggles. It's like even I look at Dennis when he's telling me he struggled. I've never seen a man so full of the Holy Spirit and so in tune with God. And to know that if he can feel it, you know, a down day, we can all feel a down day. But once again, that's why we have to build each other up. When you know that somebody's down, you need to put a hand out and say, here, let me help you with that. Back to the pretending part. I truly believe it's time for us to step up more than we ever have before and step into what God has for a calling in our life. 
The harvest truly is great and the workers are few. And we have to really step into what he wants us to do. You know, you can say, well, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have this. You can do it in your daily routine with the people that are around you and who you come in touch with. Heck, it might be even just showing with your actions may sound like little things, but even holding the doors for people or opening doors for people or helping them with moving stuff, helping them. I mean, it's just, it can be anything. And it's the actions that speak louder than the words anyway on how we do things. And, and it's, we are the light of the world because we have him in us. The word light is in the Bible 272 times. It's in 235 different verses. Now that's going to vary depending on what translation you're looking at, but I'm thinking that's kind of important. If he's mentioned it that many times, it's mentioned that many times in the word that there's something to it. That light's something that's supposed to be shine and it's not something that's supposed to be hid. And I'm not perfect. I you know, I may try to play that way on times, but and I don't know if you've noticed and I've noticed it more lately, but I need to notice it even more is when I walk into places, people stare at me. And I'm thinking, what are they seeing? Well, they're not even looking at me. They're looking at who's in me. But I need to take the cue that when they do that to go engage if they're open to it and share the word with them. Now I got to admit, I'm, I'm not great at it. And I miss a lot of opportunities and then beat myself up for it. But that's not what he wants us to do either. He doesn't want you to beat yourself up because you don't think you're good enough. He'll give you another opportunity to do it. He'll open the door again. We just have to be ready when he opens the door again and be listening for his voice and be listening for what he wants us to do. Now I understand that some of us in here that have been coming in that haven't, you know, spent as much time, you know, you always talk about mature Christians, but sometimes I think the ones that come right in are the ones that are more on fire than the mature Christians. But they may need someone to step alongside of them to guide them a little bit as they catch some of their fire and move with them so that you can help them with what they're doing but also catch what they've got so that everybody's on fire and a big bonfire. What's that? It's a Christian bonfire. There's a bunch of them out there. Yeah, because I had this down here. I don't know if I really need to share this. Jim Kubiak had put a thing on about he, about looking to see what your name, your meaning of your name is biblically. Because lots of times it really can say what you, his, his comes up, end up being the, both his, his first name and his, his last name bring up Jacob. So he's a Jacob, Jacob, which I can see that in Jim. Mine actually is, Kevin in, in Hebrew means handsome. I'm not sure I, I'm claiming it. I'm claiming it. Um, Mark means uh, polite and shining, which is my middle name. And Snyder comes from a tailor. So Micah goes, hey, I got a handsome, polite, shining tailor that lives with me. Like, <laughs> Consequently, that's the way I dress the way I do, I guess. I don't know. Now in this, we have the light. We've been given the light. The other one that, that I really love, there's a couple of verses that I, you're going to hear verses that I really love. One of them is, is uh, Acts 4.13. I've stuck on this one for a long time because this is what it says. It says, the council, of, the council members were astonished as they witnessed the bold courage of Peter and John especially when they discovered that they were just ordinary, ordinary men who had never had religious training. Then they began to understand the effect Jesus had on them simply by spending time with him. Think about that. 
they were shining just because they'd gleaned from Jesus while they were with him. They were, they were shining with Jesus because they'd walked with him. And it was enough that people could tell. They're like, these guys shouldn't be able to do this because they haven't had the religious schooling to do this. They shouldn't be able to do any of this because they haven't gone to school. They weren't the chosen ones because you had to be chose to go to school and to be raised in, the, in, in Jerusalem, in the faith, Judaism. You had to be chosen to do that. So a lot of people didn't get that opportunity. But yet these guys are doing more than those guys ever did. And all they did was walk with Jesus. All they did was walk with Jesus. All they did was walk with Jesus. So get in the Word. Get Jesus in you. If you want your light to shine, you've got to put as much in there as you can. You've got to be overfilled and pouring out. Completely filled with what He's given you and then pouring it out. Because once you get full, it's got to go somewhere. The other one that I really like, which I think I wrote on the back, is, is uh, Acts 1.8. And this is, in, this is in the Passion Translation, because I like it better in that one. It says, but I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be seized with power. It doesn't say you will get power or you possibly, it says you will be seized with power. You will receive the power. You will be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on earth. So it says not only are we going to receive it, we're going to use it. Of course, receiving takes something, but using takes something too. It's all about what you do with what you get. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Matter of fact, I think most of the times he's in there, it says it's not going to be easy, but that's just me. When we walk with Jesus, like I was saying, when we walk with Jesus, we get what he's got, and that's the part of the synergy because we rub off on each other. The more that we can, we can get him in us, and rub off on each other. One of the things that was amazing at the men's retreat is, I like the lots of times when I go to one of those things, is just sit and watch and listen. The different perspectives that people have on different things. Now there's some that are way out here, there's some that are way out here, but they all come there for one reason. To focus on God. There was guys talking about their diets, you know, Vegetables are terrible. The vegetables are terrible for you. The one guy had this thing. He said that vegetables were vegetables were bad for you because, and that they were getting more toxic and more toxic because they were trying to keep you from eating their kids. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but the man is a devout Christian, and he knows the Bible, and he knows God, and he blesses people. Can I get by the fact that he thinks the babies are after, baby vegetables are after us? Yeah, I can get by that. <laughs> it's one of those things where you, you have to be able to know what the main point is. And the main point was God. Were there differing opinions there? Were there differing? It was all kinds of different. People come from different places. You don't know what they'd been dealing with. You have no idea what they've been through. But you had one thing in common. You were there to worship God. And there was a lot of it. And just to be able to speak into those men's lives was amazing. Totally amazing. You know, it, it was talking about the light. This is a couple of verses I have here that talk about the different ones. It says, Matthew 5.14, it says, your lives, your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance. For how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who would light a lamp and hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's a place where everyone in the house can benefit from the light. Well, if we've got the light and we're hiding, what good does the light do? 
I mean, literally, what, what good is light if you're just going to close it up in yourself and not share it? And I get it that we, we uh, how do I want to say this? It's terrifying. It's fear. There is a fear that you shouldn't have, but you can have about sharing. It's something that you have to get over. And actually, I can tell you that the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's just like anything. is it, Practicing it and doing it and putting it out there. Putting it out there with your heart. You think, well, I don't know what to say. Well, I can guarantee if you get up there and you start a conversation and you don't know what to say, Holy Spirit's going to give you something to say. I didn't think I could get a prophetic word for 48 people in a row either the other night, but I did. I'd look back at the next guy and it was right there. But as the more you do it, the more it just comes easier to do. And it becomes walking with God and walking with Jesus. The more you do it, the more you just get into that and you, you don't even have to think about it. There's also a similar verse that he does the parable in Mark 4, 21 and 23, which is the same thing about having the light and put it under a basket. It's like, why would you do that? There's just no reason. One of the other ones that I put down is John. John 1, 4 through 5. And it says, In him was life. That life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. So if we can shine our light, it's going to take the darkness out of places that people have and out of us. And we need to shine it in every corner of our life. There's times that we hold on to stuff that we think, ah, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's just a little thing. So you're trying to tell me a little sin's any different than a big sin? They're the same thing. They're the same thing. Well, well, I'm not murdering anybody. No, but you're watching something on the screen that you're not supposed to be. What's the difference? That's one of the things at the end of the, there's a proclamation we make at the end of every meeting we have up there that, that Dave Champion is the one that runs it. He's been doing it for 26 years. He's been doing that retreat up there. He's a guy from over, over in Grandview, Washington. But he has it. And it's uh, We are full of light and there's no darkness in us. And we say it every time we get done with a, with a meeting. Or every time we have a testimony, every time we have a... The more you say it to the self and the more you believe it, the more you'll be able to do it the more you will go after it. So then comes the question, how do we keep the light? Well, one time it's just spending your time in the Word, being with people, like-minded people that also have the light. Because if your light starts to get dim, their light can help yours light get bright again. That's the synergy thing that Chris keeps talking about. Because we can't shine on our own strength. We can try all you want to, but we can't shine on our own strength. You'll wear out, you'll burn out. And if it's your strength, it's not the one they need to hear anyway. We need to shine with his strength, with his light, with his power. And that's one of the other verses that I really like is Matthew 7, 7 and 8. And it's also similar one is in Luke 11, 9 and 10. But it says, ask, for the, ask and the gift is yours. Seek and you'll discover. Knock and the door will be open for you. For every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find the door open. So it's not just that we go, oh, I got the light. I'm done. I'm going to go share the light. I got it. It's here. You need to keep seeking. 
You need to keep asking. You need to keep knocking. And a lot of people look at it, it's like, ask, seek, knock, and you'll get it. Well, you ask, seek, knock, and you get it. But then to keep it, you have to keep asking, seeking, and it's just persistently. That means your prayer life every day. That means being in the Word every day. That means, that means doing, doing the things that He's nudged you to do that you keep putting off. Like writing a book. I won't mention any names. Sorry, that was kind of an inside joke. She's, she's supposed to be writing a book for five years and she just started it. But I don't mean to call her out, but I think she can handle it. And she started it and she said it's going good. So we just keep praying for that. Because it's going to be an awesome testimony of their lives that will touch so many people. Because she's putting it out there for others to hear. Our testimony is huge. We were sitting up there and they have asked people to do testimonies and they're like, well... You know, I don't know if I... No, your testimony is the biggest thing you have to evangelize with. I don't care what you say it is, what it is. Now I used to look at mine and say, well, all these people, you know, they're addicted to this and they had a terrible childhood and their parents beat them. And I don't have that, God. What am I going to testify about? My parents were really good. They were with me all the time. They raised me and supported me. Was it completely Christian? No, it wasn't. But they were there and they supported me in anything I do. And right now, they support me more than they ever have in what I do. Did my parents do that? No, but they know who God is and they know what it does for me and they know what I'm doing. And they totally, I mean, they they donated to both of my mission trips even though they were living on Social Security because they wanted me to go do it. You know, Chris tells his testimony about the things that he'd done in the past. And I can almost stand right next to him and mirror what he did. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but I'm standing here now doing this. Sharing with you what, what I went through and what... I mean, he spent time, you know, he talks about the fishing boats. and I did the fishing boats and last. He talks about selling drugs. I sold drugs. He talks about taking, I think I took everything under the sun. But I can honestly say I'm glad I did it back in the 80s when drugs were actually just the drug they said. I can't even imagine with fentanyl and those things being out there right now. You're playing Russian roulette with anything you take. I'm not saying that God planned for me to take those back then just to keep me safe, but I'm glad he did. I mean, there was times I can remember not remembering anything and drinking alcohol until I blacked out and people would tell me what I did the next day. Or who I was with or what I, I mean, it's just, but I can honestly say he had his hand on my life or I wouldn't be here right now. How many times we would be not only, and I just, how many, God bless you that I never ran into anybody when I was drinking and driving either. There was time, one time I remember we, I gave somebody a ride home and they said, well, what, what can I do for you? Well, I don't know. What do you got? Well, we got some weed. I went, okay. We smoked some stuff. I was so out of it, I couldn't even feel the pedals on the car. I pulled back into home and I kept pushing on the brake and pushing on the brake and I went, oh, the car's already stopped. I'm like, How? Why? And that's when I take those things to God and say, what do you want me to do? (laughs) What did you save me for? Who do you want me to touch? Where do you want me to go? There's a reason that you got me through this. Because you had a plan. And I don't think the plan was more drugs and more drinking. But I can also say that I'm very blessed because I never got addicted to any of it. To be honest, it scared me. I hated to be out of control. And you are not in control when you do any of that stuff. I, uh, I spent 
10 years after high school. I went to high school. I thought I was going to get married right out of high school, and then we broke up, which just crushed me. And I spent 10 years just traveling, different jobs, different towns, different states. It took me until the divorce from my, my uh, first wife when I was 38 years old to figure out that what I was searching for was him. I started searching at 18 and I didn't really find him until I was 38. I was looking, just didn't know what I was looking for. I was looking for love, like another song, looking for love in all the wrong places. I needed his love. And there was nothing that could fill that but his love. You can search and search and search, but his love is way better than anybody's love you can get on this earth. You know, I haven't, some of you have told the story about Mike and I meeting. Both of us had got to the point where we decided we weren't even going to, we, we were done. We, neither of us were going to get married again. Neither of us were going to do boyfriends again. We were just done. I was actually, before we got married, I was going to move down to, a, which wouldn't have been a bad thing, a farm that does, like the farm that we want to do, the ranch that we want to do. And I was just going to move down there and help them and help them build it and do everything. So I'd actually had that dream about doing that that ranch. And then Mike and I started talking and she'd actually had the same vision. But it was amazing that we even connected because we connected online through uh, Christian Mingle. But our parameters that you're supposed to put in the thing didn't even match. She wasn't looking for anybody as old as me by a lot of years. She wasn't looking for anybody that lived as far away as I did, miles-wise. She wasn't going to look at anybody's profile that didn't tell exactly who they were, have pictures of them, and all that. I didn't have anything on mine. I had one picture, a couple words. I had been on it before and then got off. I had been on it before and got off and said, you know, I... I'm just done, God. There's nobody out there. I'd looked at the, the, the other dating sites and I'd looked at them for three years and it was the same women all three years. And I'm thinking, maybe I don't want to meet any of these women. They've been on this site for three years. Maybe I need to go somewhere else. So anyway, I wake up one morning and there's a little smiley face that's been sent to me and it's from Micah. And I'm like, Ooh, who's this? Nobody sent me a smiley face. So I, I answered back. And if you heard her side of the story, she's like, I didn't send that. There's no way I would have sent him a smiley face. <laughs> she talks about how the picture was not a handsome picture either. <laughs> but when we started to talk, I knew her name was Micah, and we started talking on the phone. And I said, so is that like Micah in the Bible? And she goes, her ears started to perk up because I knew who Micah was. And then I said, so are you prophetic? Are you like, she goes, well, that just opened her eyes even more. So then we ended up connecting and, and making, I did lots of 300 mile trips for a year and a half before we got married. But we connected and God had put a vision in both of our hearts for the same thing. I mean, it just blows my mind what he can do. So don't ever question what he can do or how he can do it. I mean, if we can meet from that far away and have absolutely nothing in common on our profiles to be able to even be a reason that we would see each other, but I can tell you, I look forward to working with that woman for the rest of my life. She is a God-given woman that just loves the Lord and loves people. I mean, I haven't told her, I said, if you want to be the preacher, I'll be your backup. I'll do whatever it is to be around if that's what God wants me to do. Now, I have no, no doubt that we will both be preaching together at some point. We'll be leading other kind of ministry. We've been told that, that's the other one. We've been told that we were going to do marriage ministry. And I went, 
I've been divorced twice, God. How does that work? And he said, it, it works because you know what not to do. And now you're learning what to do. And you're doing it in a way that people need to know how it's supposed to be done. And a lot of you knew who Micah was years ago, but, and I'm not trying to brag. I'm not in any way. But she has blossomed so much in the years that we've been married. It is amazing. She's back to who she should be and even more than what she should be. Was that me? No, that was God through me. Supporting her in what she wanted to do and where she wanted to go and being who she should be. Are we perfect? We're not even close. But we're working on it. It's a journey. It's a journey that I'm willing to work on. That was kind of a segue there. I'm not sure that was all wrote down. I know none of it was, but... Um, we work together in synergy and in speaking like that. We've actually had people ask us now to speak into their marriage, do pre-marriage counseling for them, and just put out what we have figured out, how a marriage works. You have to be able to listen to what God wants you to do and do it. Mike was talking about the, the uh, was it Mike who was talking about? Was that you that was talking about how to, how to worship God? Who was that? We were talking yesterday at men's breakfast. Oh, it's Tim. That was Tim. He said, one of the biggest ways we can worship God is doing what he tells us to do. <laughs> like, Wow. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, if he's urging you to go do something, you're worshiping by doing what he wants you to do. Going out and putting out what you have and putting it out there the way he wants you to. A lot of people think it's like with the testimony, they don't think they have anything to share. Your life is worth sharing, whatever it is. Whatever you've been through, he's, if you've been through anything, that means you can help somebody else through it. I really can't put this out enough. I think this is the time that we're supposed to shine. This is a time we're supposed to be out there. You know, I don't know if that's freaking people out or they're going, well, no, I can't. No, this is what we're here for. This is what we're supposed to do. I mean, it says in... in uh, the Great Commission in Mark 28, 18 through 20, it says, Then Jesus came close to them and said, All authority of the universe has been given to me. So he has all the authority in the universe. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Holy Spirit and teach them a faithful, to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of the age. He's given us everything that he has. It's in us. You don't have to be able to do it. He'll do it for you. You just have to be the vessel that goes to do it. You have to step out. He can't work through you and let you let him. He can't reach the people unless you do. That's just like I was debating on going to the men's retreat. And Micah looked at me, grabbed my face, put her hands on both sides, and she goes, you're going to the men's retreat. <laughs> and I went, Holy Spirit, thank you. I'm going to the men's retreat. But it was a total blessing for me and I'm sure some of the other guys by being there. You need to step into what he has. You need to shine as bright as you can. We were up there, Nathaniel was the white that was the one that was, uh, was leading the the meetings at night. And he, uh, like Paul said, he had a way of putting things in the Bible that you probably had never heard or heard it in that way. A new way of looking. And it's a new perspective, a new thing. So you heard it different than you'd heard it before. And then he was good at using his testimony to show what he meant. So it was really good. But one of the things that I, I was listening, we were talking about one morning was 
he was talking about evangelism and after one of the testimonies or in the middle of, it was in the middle of one of the really good discussions that we had or right after it, but he was talking about we need to make disciples. We need to do that. And he'd actually sat down and calculated that if, if one guy discipled one guy a year, so he discipled one the first year and then those two discipled, each discipled one, then you'd have four and then the next year four. If it went that way, we could evangelize the earth in 37 years. But then he went back and said, he goes, so I, I was asked, I actually messaged him because I told him I was going to use it today. And he said, the other one is, he just Googled to see how many people say they're evangelical Christians, what the number is. So if everyone that says they're an evangelical Christian disciples one person a year, so every year that would double the amount of people, the entire earth would be evangelized in five years. Five years. If we start shining our light and we put out there and we actually disciple people and we actually do what God's pushing us to do, we can evangelize the whole earth in five years. Would that not be amazing? Would not heaven be on earth? Heaven's already on earth through us. We just need to spread it to everybody else. This is probably a little... Actually, it is almost... It is almost noon. I guess I did enough stuff beforehand. I didn't have to preach very long. Um, There's three things that I really want you to take away from this. Or to think about, at least. There's another thing we were talking about at Men's Breakfast was... If I don't give you something to think about or something to question when I preach, I haven't done my job. It should be something that piques your interest to either question or to think about. The first thing is, we are the light of the world. I think you remember that. We are the light of the world. We are the ones that have the light. We need to shine that light and spread that light. Two, is we need to continually shine it. We need to tuck the light under the bed or under the basket or under the... We need to keep it open and out. Remember the thing of the green lantern where his light, his chest lights up and and, uh, point it wherever you want it to go and let the Holy Spirit out. The third one is, and I think this one is just as important, is keep working together to keep each other's light shining. Keep building each other up. Even if it's like encouraging one word. Tell somebody they look beautiful. Tell somebody they look handsome. Tell somebody thank you for what they did. Tell somebody, I mean, just, it's easy to do. And then when they've got something, they come to you, help them through it. Synergy means you come together and you do more. But in order to come together and do more, you have to know what the other one does and who they are to put everything together to make it grow more. So if you don't mind, I'll have you stand. We'll do a little activation here. I love activations. What we do in down here activates spiritually, what you do in the natural. So remember, some of you saw me do the, or I did the communion three weeks ago, I think it was, and I was talking about the veil being torn into the Holy of Holies, but what my point was, we needed to tear our veil. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to tear our veil that's in front of us from the top to the bottom so that our light shines. We're not veiling that light. We're not covering that light. We're not hiding it behind a curtain. We're not putting it behind smoke and mirrors. We're releasing it. So I just want everybody to stand there. Give yourself a little room. And I want you to reach up like you're grabbing the top of a curtain. And on the count of three, we'll just tear it open all the way down. One, two, three. Now your light's shining out for everybody to see. 
So don't be surprised when you leave here if there's people looking at you. Because they're going to be able to see the light that you have coming out of you now. I call it prophetically out right now. I proclaim it. That your light is out now. You got no way to hide. It's there. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Harvest Valley Worship Center is called to be a refuge for healing and a launch pad for transformation. If this message impacted you today, please let us know in a comment, or you can email us at media at hvwc.com. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to connecting with you.